want to share? You're already up. Come on up. Then you're next. Hi, I'm Linda Unger, and I'm a senior instructional designer in the Faculty Center at Stony Brook University. And um, what I have really is an invitation, uh, but it's still pretty cool. Um, in fall of 2013, Dr. Meg Shadell um, launched Coursera's first uh, SUNY MOOC with the help of my colleague Jennifer Adams, who's sitting there. And um, since then, Coursera has expanded their model into what's called specializations. So the existing MOOC, which is 15 weeks long, needs to be expanded to 20 weeks. And what Dr. Shadell would like to do is have guest lecturers who are uh, commenting and teaching on the cultural aspects of digital arts, um, add their content and their expertise to the MOOC. So what we have is a call for proposals, and I'll hand these out later, for faculty who would, uh, Jennifer has them right there, okay. Um, the call for proposals uh, invites faculty with expertise in this area, especially with respect to cultural diversity, to propose a week's worth of content to be added to Meg's MOOC, and then to actually participate in the MOOC. The faculty will be brought to Stony Brook to do some video recording, uh, and then we'll create some activities around their content uh, for a week worth of instruction in the MOOC. Uh, so please um, share this with your faculty. Thank you so much. Okay, who's next on the list? Jean? Yep. <clears throat> Hi everybody, my name is Jean Myers. I'm an instructional designer at Erie Community College. I'm also a PhD student at SUNY at Buffalo, and I am doing a research study very applicable to what everybody deals with in online learning. And my topic has to do with uh, the concept of usability, and what that means is how does a user interact with an online course. Believe it or not, there's not a lot of um, hard research out there on exactly what's happening uh, with what we call user interaction experience. There's a ton of research in marketing and web design and in business, but not for us. So I decided to try and fill that gap. And I have um, basically two online courses, one that is what we call raw, meaning the type of thing you probably see every day uh, that has not been redesigned, and then a second course that's been instructionally redesigned. And it was also peer reviewed by two folks here with us at the Donna Snelly and Ann Reed uh, peer reviewed the courses. And what I would like to do is invite you to participate in the study. You can simply participate when it asks you who you are, just say you're a faculty. And um, the instructions and steps are right on the research site. Um, if you would hit for me purpose and details. What it is, is um, I have actually um, some detail in there about some of the general research that's out there. And also um, on the, if you go back a page for me. When you're ready to participate, click on Next Steps. Uh, and it will give you a link to a Blackboard test site. And then uh, you can interact with one or both of the courses. And it's about a 35 question survey at the end of it. And I will share the research results with all of you when it's done, which should be in the next month or so. And I'll have the final reports out um, in spring. So help a poor PhD student graduate, <laughs> please. I'm, I'm dying to get done. <laughs> Thank you. OK, Doug, are you next? Doug? Okay, no need to look up at the screen. Um, so real quick, uh, how many people are familiar with uh, COIL? Okay, good. If you don't know what it is, ask the person next to you. Uh, all I wanted to talk about was uh, Oswego's done a bunch of COIL courses now, and 
what I wanted to talk about was one specific one that we're doing that's kind of new ground for us is actually one that's a CAD CAM course with the University of Antwerp. And it's giving us a chance to use a lot of technology beyond just the standard, here's a communications area for you to uh, collaborate in. We're using uh, programs specifically designed for workflow on technical documents across distance and then both sides are able to 3D print out models and use our individual testing equipment and uh, then go come back together and compare results. So it's really more of a almost uh, what you would see in a business environment technical uh, composite and collaboration project. And the best part is, is we're working with Antwerp, so everything they're doing is in Dutch. So on top of this, we're translating uh, technical documents using uh, Google Translate and seeing where that ends up. Uh, brings us. So I'm just putting this out there as a cool thing because it is letting us sort of stretch the bounds as what we, for what we traditionally consider a collaborative effort between two classes. Thanks, Doug. Okay, Marty, you're up next. Uh, mine is really an announcement. Um, Doodle and NiceGate are coming together to co-sponsor the first ever Google Camp for Higher Ed. Um, Monday, April 20th, in this Syracuse area, Mike Heiss had put me on the spot. I got the word yesterday, I think we're okay. Uh, we're really there. <laughs> okay, and, and the reason is because it may be at OCC. Um, we, we have another backup site just in case we can't work it out, but right now we're saying it's going to be at OCC. Um, I'll get all the details of timing and registration and all of that out to everyone as soon as we have that place narrowed down. If you can't make that one, um, there is a just regular Google camp, which in, is a lot of K-12 people, but it's still useful. March 26th at Hamilton College. So if you can't make the one that we're doing, you can, you can hit the other one, and there will be others um, to come. We've, we've had five Google Camps so far across the state. They have been phenomenal. Um, it's an EdCamp format. How many of you are familiar with EdCamp? Nobody, really? <laughs> It's, it's a unscheduled conference, which means the group is the ones who decide what the topics are going to be, and it's, it's the things that you want to know about. How to use Google Docs in my classroom. How can I get my students to share using pieces of Google? And it, it's been phenomenal. We find people who, a small group of people who have the same desire to learn something and somebody else in the room who knows that something and we put them off in another room and they have their own session. It's worked out great. We've had a lot of great sharing. Um, it, it's, it's been a really good experience and I've really learned to love this whole ed camp idea. We're using it on our college now for some of our college days where we bring faculty together and making them find groups of people who have the same interest and then putting them together and let them talk about it instead of us scheduling all their day. So it's fun. Um, so keep an eye out and I'll make sure everybody gets the details. Thanks, Marty. Hope. Hi, everybody. Uh, another COIL, COIL um, as opposed to yesterday, which was uh, collaboration and online learning. Uh, SUNY COIL is uh, Collaborative Online International Learning and um, <clears throat> it's a great entryway for faculty who otherwise would not necessarily have done online and who might not have considered to pedagogically shift how they are in the classroom. Um, but it offers this opportunity to team teach with somebody from another country and um, what we've done on our campus, instead of having it be top down, which you know how that goes over usually, which does not, we have 
now gone in sort of into the middle and gone to the department chairs and we're creating these um, letters of agreement with various departments saying that we will support uh, faculty to do COIL and um, that COIL will, I mean, the, the faculty will get to go to the conference and um, so it's this nice collaborative way of reaching into the um, departments without having to have them feel like it's being um, an edict from on high. And we've had um, really nice response from the faculty and from the departments um, to do this. And it's a lovely way to really inspire um, a different kind of learning that David was talking about because the students have to work together in an intercultural way. So. Um, So if you can flip that switch. Um, who's next on the list? Um, Karen? Thank you. Good morning. I'm Karen Shirley Williams from the College at Brockport. I'm not sure how cool this is, but it is a solution. We offered in the fall two three credit hour courses that started after the midterm. So um, we have the ability to have a part of term that's eight weeks. And Chris Price was actually one of the instructors. So one was, a bat was introduction to liberal arts and another one was called learning to learn. And both of them did very well, partly because for our students, very often they need to find another course at midterm so they can drop the one that they're failing or withdraw but still keep a full-time load for financial aid purposes. And strategically, the learning to learn course was for students who probably could use a little learning to learn, which is why they were failing the other course. So those have worked very well. And then we also offered one, one credit course, and we do that, and we're always looking for more because very often students are one credit away from graduating. And we do offer those in summer, winter, fall and spring. So the three credits that just go for eight weeks have been very successful. And then um, particularly for my OWL consortium colleagues, I'm happy to announce that we finally have our BLS that requires no physical presence for students. It's not officially online yet because we're still um, tossing the grenade back and forth between our college senate, but um, it's a 60-credit it's a Students have to transfer in 60 credits or have at least 60 credits under their belt and then they finish the rest. So I do have brochures and I'll pass them around, but we finally got to yes on that. So thank you very much. Hi, I'm Martha Kendall from Monroe Community College. I'm shy, quiet, and demure, and that's why I don't like to be up here. <clears throat> I'm doing this because Aaron and Dave poked the bear. Um, we used a template for the migration and it really worked well. It made training for the migration so much easier on my team. We had some consistency and it was my theory as a first step to getting consistency across the college with courses to have them look similar and help the students. Then I got this brilliant idea and I built all of our new courses with another shell that all it said was, if this is empty, contact your professor, click here to email them. So that really reduced the number of emails that we were getting in our office, and that worked really, really well, and I like that. And then I took a totally non-scientific, what I consider common sense, no research, sorry, Larry, no thing to back this up at all. We have a new student Blackboard support room that has a part-time person manning it, answering questions. And I went to her and I had her keep track of what students liked in different course designs. So I didn't actually ask the students what they wanted, but I took the ones that were reporting things that they liked. And I am now building a third template which we hope to build into being able to use to um, go in with Oscar and a few other things so that new courses in development have something to start with. 
and old courses could be retrofitted pretty easily. So don't be afraid of templates. They're really cool. Thank you, Martha. Hi everyone, Kim Scalzo from Center for Professional Development and um, Open SUNY. And I, um, I know many of you are aware of the institutional readiness process, um, but I know we also have lots of um, new folks here, so I wanted to just talk about it a little bit. Um, Alex and I have designed this process to um, uh, help campuses assess where they are relative to the um, standards um, and the criteria in the um, online learning consortium quality scorecard and then to also develop an implementation plan to, for um, continuous improvement on your campus. And um, I want to just ask how many folks in the room are on a campus where you are in process with this or have completed it? So starting to be some folks out there who have some experience with this, if your campus um, you know, has not yet started this or hasn't you know, been talking about it, you, know, you can talk to one of those folks. I also want to clarif um, clarify a couple of um, what I think are you know, um, perceived uh, or misperceptions about the process. This is not Open SUNY coming to review your campus. Um, this is really about us coming to help you um, on your campus assess where you are and to develop a plan for um, ensuring that you'll be able to um, meet the, the standards for ensuring quality for, for online learning and for us to, to really kind of, we come as consultants, we um, work with your campus team, and your campus team really decides where you are, where you're gonna go, and what you're gonna do as a result of that. So, you know, we're not coming to review your courses, we're not reviewing your programs, we're not reviewing your, your, your faculty. Um, so, so I just wanna make sure that, that that's, that's um, clear. And I do have some handouts, I'll come around. I'll put a couple on each table, um, and if you have questions, um, and of course Alex and I are here and we're happy to talk about it as well, but um, I wanna also just thank all of those campuses who um, are doing this. And also the other thing I wanna do is, um, how many of you are um, folks who have gone through facilitator training with us? So there are a few of those now. We've done a couple um, train the facilitator sessions, so we're developing a network of your colleagues who can um, be doing this with us now so that we can um, get to get to all the campuses. So, um, so you know, we'll continue to, to be around and be able to talk about this, and um, um, I think that's it. Unless you want to add anything, Alex? Nope, that sounds good. Okay. Lisa? I, I'm still typing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Lisa Hoffman. It's okay, you can finish it later. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, I just wanted to make you aware that we were, FlexSpace was highlighted in the EDUCAUSE review online along with the learning space rating system. It's under the good ideas section. I know that this is not the focus of, of this particular conference, but we're getting a lot of nice integration between teaching, learning, and facilities and how to best design facilities to accommodate course capture, uh, engaged and active learning. So. Uh, I do have some cards with me. I, I can pass them around or leave them out at the front table. And I hope all of you will consider contributing your classroom spaces to FlexSpace. Thanks, Lisa. Dave Gadu is next. Oh, is she? Where? I don't, okay. I don't see her. Uh, okay. okay. Don't get your hopes up. This isn't really that good. Uh, this is actually something you can pass on to um, the uh, professors at your institution. Um, this is just a free open source quick little uh, Chrome extension that I wrote um, for the classroom. Uh, so it's accessible. I have an extension here, so. Uh, there it is. So, um, you know, if someone, if a student does something good, 
or makes a joke, <laughs> stuff like that. But it also is a freestanding app as well, so you don't have to have your browser open um, to run it. And it's all open source, so you can uh, actually. Um, ooh. You can actually run it uh, and change the sounds and change the images so that you know maybe you don't want Ooh. something like that, but you'd rather replace it with something else. Um, all sorts of good stuff. So uh, follow me on. I'll be po t tweeting the link to this because when you put it in the Chrome store, it usually takes 24 to 48 hours if you don't have the direct link. Um, and I have the GitHub code, so you can do that too. Who's next? Lenore Horowitz? It's right here, Lenore. Thank you. So Karen gave me this idea, Karen. Um, uh, you Albany Informatics Department, we have a new um, BS program in informatics. Ours is at SED. We kind of, we're going back and forth, so a little bit closer. But what I wanted to talk about is um, we have incorporated team-based learning pretty much across the curriculum. So we've got a department, it's a fairly young department, um, so we have all embraced this method. I don't know, is anybody familiar with team-based learning? Yeah, okay. Um, and most notably, um, I have gotten a group of three of us together um, we also do all of our online classes in eight-week chunks, eight-week one and eight-week two. And we are incorporating TBL in our online classes, too. So I will keep you informed and keep you up to date. There are lots and lots of challenges when we're trying to put TBL online. Um, but I thought it was interesting, and, and uh, I'll keep you informed. Okay, Jim Greenberg, I heard some clapping. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It, um, this is not directly related to online learning, but it's certainly a tool that your faculty might use um, in their courses. Um, over the last three years, I've been... Um, thanks. Um, over the last three years, a, t a group of um, campuses in SUNY that include the Center for Computational Research at the University of Buffalo are building out a high-performance computing environment for undergraduate students to be able to do large data analytic assignments. It's web accessible. Um, it, we're in the process now of trying to scale the whole thing up so it can be used across SUNY. Right now, Geneseo, Brockport, Oneana, um, perhaps New Pulse are using it. So if you have online courses where students need computational tools to complete assignments, um, it's possible that this environment could house those tools and make that stuff available. Um, and if you have any questions about it, you can let me know. I'll be happy to answer. Thanks. Okay, who's next? Who's next on the list? Greg, Teresa, Kristen, a trio. So I'm Greg Kutch, I'm Director of Academic Programs for SUNY Oswego, and I have a problem. My problem is I have a very busy staff. Uh, typically, these days, we're doing 20, 30 new online courses, 26, 26 right now, Teresa says, uh, in the queue at any given point in time. And given the fact that I've been promoted via ineptitude to middle management. It means that I know less and less about more and more. Uh, so one of my information needs is to actually know where we are at any point in time in 
terms of that mass of course development. So I, I suggested to the team that in terms of what I needed from a project management standpoint was really something that gave me, I use the traffic light metaphor, uh, red, green, yellow, you know, in terms of course status, things are okay, things are moderately behind or things are in jeopardy. So I had asked Kristen uh, to spearhead this project to try to identify something that would give us one, I think, a unified approach to course development, uh, setting standard milestones uh, that we then we can measure against where we were, and then also giving me a visual representation of what was going on. So this is probably not the be all end all, but given, given the fact that everybody is buried constantly doing course development, they said, okay, we're gonna give you this, and we're gonna start with this. So, Kristen, you wanna talk more about what this is? So, okay, so this is, um, we're using Trello.com, and what Trello does is it lets you create um, a board within which you can have a list, within which you can have a card. And this is Trello terminology. So what we've done is we've created a board for each of our um, sessions. So summer sessions one, two, summer session three, four, fall session, et cetera. And within each of those, we've created a series of cards that are based on our course development process. And with e in each of those cards, we've created, or lit, sorry, we've created lists for each of those phases within our course development process and with each of those lists we've created cards for each course that is currently under development. So what the idea is is we've created this template card that for each course that we're developing we create a card, we assign an instructional designer, and we add a color. So it's a little easy to determine um, which instructional designer is leading the course development. And within each of these cards we have lists that we check off as we complete each level of um, the phase. And as we complete a phase, we move the card from list to list to list so that at simple or a single glance, Greg can see what courses are in development, who's responsible for it, and what phase is each of those developments in. in. And it is free. Right. It is free. That, that was really one of the first requirements as we were looking at this. What could we do fast and free? Yes. Um, you know, so there are, other, there are other things that we will probably explore along the way. Um, Clark Shaw Nelson, intriguingly, is doing something at Johns Hopkins using Drupal. Uh, Jira. Jira. Why He's using Drupal? Jira. Jira. Using okay. Jira. And, you know, knowing that Clark is the open source advocate, we're, we're really interested in finding the time to chat with him and understand what they've created. Um, so if that's of interest, stay tuned on that. Thanks. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Who's next on the list? I will call on you. I think everybody here is pretty familiar with uh, the IITG website, but I did want to share one thing. Um, Uh-oh, are we going there? Okay. Um, I think an internal SUNY audience uh, understands who we are and what a lot of us are doing and can easily get to the website and navigate around. But First of all, under reporting outcomes, those of you who have projects underway, there is no longer a password necessary to report outcomes. So as you, as you contribute more or grow more out of your grants, please don't forget to come in and, and give us links to any articles or pubs. Also wanted to make sure that people were aware of, for example, if you go to any one of these, oh, I see, this is in a, this is in a mobile format. Okay, off to the right-hand side of um, the standard web pages, or here you'll see all of these themes, and that's designed to enable audiences external to SUNY to come in, look at the, the, the themes that mirror the ELI content anchors. So someone from Minnesota may not know one of us in the room, but they may want to learn more about one of the content anchors. 
So the idea is you can go in and look at that. Everyone is struggling right now with the, the people who are engaged in uh, seed grant programs around the country are scheduling with how, yeah, struggling with how to best scale up outcomes and share those outcomes with each other in a manner that makes sense. So I, I just wanted to encourage any of you with ideas to please pass those along so we can maximize our impact. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, who's next? What's going on at TC3 with Kaleidoscope? Or what's, uh, Sherry, what are you doing in Second Life that you might want to come and talk about? Or who else is out there? Yep, come on. Eric, perfect. I want, to, I, I want you to come up too. So I won't, I won't bring it up, but Eric Mahan Houd, um, Binghamton University, and our instructional design team is using WordPress to internally keep track of clients that we work with. So we have categories set up in WordPress and menu dri menus driven by those categories for each of the schools at a university. So when we consult with a client, we categorize them by school and then we add tags by how we are working with them, whether it be flipping the classroom, online learning, um, if they're involved in some type of workshop. That way when we have to report back to others who we are serving or we need to pull together lists of um, who we want to pinpoint with certain pieces of information, we have that uh, data at our fingertips and it's working out very well. Great, thanks. Sherry? Come on up and talk about Second Life. <laughs> You love this torture. Hi, uh, I'm Sherry Chisholm from SUNY Ulster, and uh, <clears throat> I'm currently working on a Second Life project on uh, SUNY, what do we call the island? SUNY Medical Island. And um, it already has a vet tech hospital set up, complete with moving pets, chickens, goats, sheep, cattle, <laughs> guinea pigs, ferrets, mice. Um, so that students can practice what they would do in a vet clinic. Um, we also have, oh, she's going to go look at it. That would help. I don't know if I, is it going? Oh, I can tell you've been there because that's the old floor. This is very risky, right, doing Second Life Live yes. so on, on whatever internet we've got going here. <laughs> I hope it doesn't crack. Oh, yeah. I figured I'd wait till she called it up. So originally our hospital was a, yeah, you're in part of the old hospital, um, was a giant strip that students could drop into and um, practice the various things. But we have changed, there? there we go. We have changed to a system of pods and each pod focuses on a different aspect of nursing. And they're all linked by a teleporter elevator where they go and they can select the floor they want to be on. Um, it's still in development, but all the rooms will have interactive televisions so that our nursing staff can create YouTube videos that will help the students learn what they need to learn about cardiac issues, about pregnancy and OB, about um, the emer what it is to be an emergency room nurse. So we'll have <clears throat> televisions in every patient room. Yeah, I'm not on my game today. Um, as well as interactive computer screens that will also have different set of videos to help assist in the learning process. So sorry, Sherry, okay. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not giving a good tour because I'm not sure where to go. But it's okay. Uh, each pod is color-coded so that the student knows where he or she is at any given time, which was kind of fun, actually. Uh, emergency is red. You'll see red strip and red tile on the floor. Um, surgery is, is gray, so everything is coded gray. Um, that's OB, is coded green. 
And we're trying for as accurate as possible. Our OB room actually has a tub for water birth. Oh, and cool. uh, all the accoutrements that go with it. You'd be surprised where you have to go to get things like KY jelly in Second Life. It's a little scary. Okay, um, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, my emergency room area is much further along in the development process than the others. It has everything. It's got the, um, the Vacutron. It's got uh, the sinks. Every time the students wash their hands, they get a card. And at the end, they have to tell the instructor how many of those cards they actually collected. It's a test to make sure they realize that they have to wash their hands after every procedure, between procedures. I mean, think about it. How many of you have spent time in a hospital lately? Yeah, and they've got to wash their hands constantly. And this helps them learn that. Here's See, if you elevator. touch the black spot in front of the elevator. The black spot. On the floor. Oh, that elevator. was, yeah. There you go. You get to select where you where you need to go. You need to go to the OB. lobby, med surge, OB, or the OR. OB. And it'll take you to that elevator right there so that it's easy for students and instructors to get from place to place. And uh, you know you're in OB because it's got that scary tile. And um, like we were saying, we're setting this up so we have a, a birthing room with the water tub. Oh, there it is. I We've just got saw the it. incubators. We've got um, yeah. That's awesome. Warming beds. We're striving for accuracy, and uh, I can't wait for faculty to start recording video for this project, so that when the student goes in and the little card says your patient is experiencing this, they can click on the television in the corner of the room. And it'll tell them something about that. Their instructor's face will pop up in a YouTube video and give them that instruction, which I think will be a vast improvement. OK, so. So am I free now? Yeah, Alex? you're free. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, the fact that I still remembered how to walk in Second Life was really freaking awesome. I, I, I was doing it, so. Does it? Yeah, we need to fix. <laughs> okay, who's next? Robin Sullivan. Come on down. Hi everybody, I'm Robin Sullivan from the University of Buffalo and I just want to invite all of you to the Digital Challenges series. Um, it is a series of events that UB has been putting together this year and our next event is scheduled for April 1st and the um, theme of the event is uh, it's a majority of presentations by students. There will be also some faculty keynotes that will be talking about what students are using in your classes as far as technology. And it's a free event. Um, we had two events earlier this year that have been co-sponsored by our um, Office of the CIO, the UB Libraries, our Center for Educational Innovation, and Student Life. And um, welcome anybody that can make it to Buffalo on April 1st to come down. It should be a great set of presentations and also some unconference sessions by students. Um, it will also be streamed, so digitalchallenges.com will have the links, and uh, so. Thanks, Robin. Uh, did I see Dean Dyer on the list next? Sure. So, as some of you know, I'm one of the longtime Blackboard people around here. And let's see, grab me a new tab. See how well I can type with one hand and talk at the same time, already failing. All right, so one of the things that I found out very quickly on, it's just running through admin tasks were that I had certain things that I did all the time. And Blackboard uh, wasn't necessarily terribly efficient doing some of them, and the extra clicks that it took me doing, uh, it's were onerous.
Yeah, one-handed typing just really <laughs> isn't my forte. All right. All right, so if I can actually get logged in, it's what I did was I took a lot of the things that I do repeatedly over and over and over again that took me three, four clicks, pull down menus and, and things like that. It's uh, all along the way. And I used on the sysadmin tab, although you could realistically fit this into uh, any HTML module that you wanted to create in terms of tabs. I use the hotspots area. And so if I need to search for a course ID, I don't have to switch into courses and then choose my selection criteria. I've hard coded in the fact that I'm looking inside the course ID. So for instance, if I want to pull up all of my uh, spring courses, I can just pop right in. And because we have the instructor's name in the course ID, I can search by instructor name. You know, it's it, anything like that, which saves me a lot of time from clicking into courses, then choosing my criteria and running through. Um, so it's I've done the same thing with user ID. Their J number, which is our student identification number, because sometimes students know that, sometimes they don't. Sometimes it gets reported, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, it's, I use the impersonate feature a lot, which if you don't know about the impersonate feature, you can put in an actual user's ID. So if I'm working with a student and I need to see exactly what they're seeing, I can actually log into the system as them. Uh, it's, but I have to scroll to the bottom of my page to get to that down in tools. I don't like scrolling, so I put it up in here. Uh, it's, likewise, I've hard-coded hard searches for uh, my online courses in there so that when I have to look up uh, our online courses for any particular term, I click one button to go to that. Uh, and then I just switch them out. So it's, that's something that has saved me an awful lot of time. So if you're interested, uh, it's up in the uh, Google Doc, I threw my email, so ask me about it. I can send you kind of the code so that you don't have to go wading into the HTML. Okay. Uh, what time is it? Okay, we have time. Um, Bob, you want to come over and talk about OER and Blackboard migration? So uh, these aren't really tips, but I just want to make a report uh, from TC3. It's the best place to stand. Um, first of all, we've completed our Blackboard migration, and we survived. Um, we do have some bumps and bruises, <laughs> but officially we've completed. So uh, I, guess I, I guess I'll make this known that uh, I'll be retiring within two years. And I looked at this as a gauntlet that I had to go through before retirement. <laughs> but it, it really wasn't so bad. With regard to OER, we're still in the process of trying to motivate our faculty to get on board with it. As many of you know, we have several faculty who have had great success with OER. And um, um, thanks to um, Mark McBride and Tony, I think we've developed more interest at Monroe, uh, where uh, Tony and Mark have been developing a uh, one-day colloquium for next Friday. How many uh, instructors do you have coming to that? Oh. 90. 90? So we're very happy about that. And another thing we have, which is really in the planning stages, we're not exactly sure how we're going to do this yet. But uh, we want to get students, uh, we want to get the information out to students on which courses not necessarily have OER, but have low cost textbooks and other resources. So we're trying to come up with a way to identify those sections in our course schedule. Um, and there are courses all along who haven't been using textbooks and have no extra fees. And so that's why, I don't know technically if you'd call those OER or not. But from the student point of view, 
we want them to know which courses aren't going to have um, highly expensive textbooks. So we're working on that one. Megan, you want to talk about Ignite Your? Yeah, it just comes through right now. <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> So it's on my iPad, it's just not showing up on the screen yet, so maybe when I'm done talking. Um, just wanted to go ahead and uh, promote our every, um, every, Ignite Your Everyday Creativity MOOC that our um, Creative Studies uh, course or program is doing um, on Coursera. Um, so we are in week three mod, or week two right now. You have five more days to join the signature track if you are interested in doing that. Um, we do have, um, Almost 40,000 people um, registered for the MOOC, so it is really exciting and seeing the number of people going in there. Um, even if you just come in and watch some of the videos, we have been highlighting um, alumni, faculty, staff, of, um, and community members within Buffalo who are showing how they are creative. So um, there's different tracks that you can come in and watch if you want to learn about creativity, to um, be inspired, to be creative. Um, it's just a really great um, experience, and I hope you join us. Thank you very much. Okay, is it 11.15 yet? Is it about 11.15? Okay, so I'm going to say we're going to break. Um, we are back here at 11.30, is that correct? Um, for the first of two keynote speakers, David Wiley made it here. Um, it was, you know, iffy there uh, for a minute. He was stuck in, in several different places on his way here, and I don't think that he has slept. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, please uh, be back here at 11.30 for our first uh, keynote with David Wiley. Thank you very much.